my name is Kathy McCall. I am the Adv Advocacy Director for AARP here in Washington State. We have roughly 900,000 members in the state, and we have been actively involved in supporting the Long-Term Care Trust Act, which created the WACARES Fund. Um, and long-term care, as I, you know, kind of joke with people, is kind of, for AARP, it's priority number one, number two, and number three in some form or fashion whether it's how to live your best life or plan for your future or how to pay for your retirement and long-term care. And that's what we're here talking about today. Um, AARP, along with the Commonwealth Fund and the SCAN Foundation have pretty consistently named Washington State one of the top states for our long-term care system. And that's not just coincidence. It's been a lot of work by legislators, such as the legislators joining us today, and by a lot of dedicated people in DSHS and advocates um, wanting to really make change. And our system is really built on home and community-based services so that we can really support people as they age. So from AARP's perspective, supporting the Walk Cares Fund was just a natural extension of the investments that we have made as a state to support and create a strong, vibrant, long-term care system so people can age with purpose and dignity and not have to worry as much about the financial burdens of long-term care. So it's a great um, opportunity, I think, for Washington State. Um, and I'm really excited to have um, both Senator Cleveland here and Representative Stonier. So I wanna end also Ben Bechte um, is also here. So I'd like to just open up with Senator Cleveland. You've been very active as chair of the Senate Health Care in supporting um, and helping advance the Long-Term Care Trust Act, which created the Walk Cares program. Could you share some opening remarks? Yes, I'd be happy to, Kathy, and I'm just so pleased to uh, join you and Ben and my seatmate, Representative Monica Stonier tonight, to talk a little bit about the Washington Cares Fund and, um, and share a bit of perspective from uh, my view as chair of the Senate Health and Long-Term Care Committee, um, as well as um, my view as, uh, as you know, from a personal standpoint. Um, I'm gonna say first off that um, so many families are in crisis and I can't think of a time uh, uh, in the past that the importance of access to healthcare has ever been more evident uh, to all of us. And yet we know that too many can't meet their healthcare needs and especially uh, their long-term care needs. Um, we know 70% of all of us will need long-term care at some point in our lives and Medicare does not cover long-term care. Um, our state's Medicaid program do does cover some of those costs but only after someone has spent down their cash and their assets uh, to a low enough level that they can qualify for the program. Um, private long-term care insurance options have been slowly dwindling away. Many, many insurers have abandoned this market because it's too expensive and it doesn't make a profit. Um, for example, I'll share that in 2001, there were approximately 137 long-term care plans that were offered per purchase in our state. Today, uh, there are only 10 uh, available plans uh, that uh, are being offered um, as of 2020. Um, the insurance is costly. Uh, the benefits are variable. The premiums can increase at any time and uh, the chances of coverage going away is a very real threat. And uh, I wanna share that this issue is personal for me because in fact, that's what happened uh, to uh, myself. I purchased long-term care uh, insurance through a private insurer. I paid premiums for many, many years till suddenly I received notice that the plan was canceled. Um, so, you know, the private market simply can't provide the peace of mind that we all deserve. Um, we need to know that as we age, as our loved ones age, that we're going to um, be able to have the dignity of taking care of our needs or of their needs. Um, so that's really what led um, our state and uh, leaders uh, on the health care committee in both the Senate and the House, um, where Representative Stonier serves, um, to proactively address what we see as a really urgent need. Um, we need to take the fear away of not having options 
when you might need care in your home or care in a, a facility, any kind of long-term care. Um, I know too many families, including my own, who are struggling to care for older parents while also struggling to, to juggle work and, and caring for their own children and families. So I support the Washington Cares Fund because it's gonna help relieve the stress and worry for individuals and families in our state. And so pleased to have this opportunity to talk more about the program today and thank you. Representative Stonier, would you like to um, comment on your work related to the Walk Cares Fund? Oh, thank you. Um, and since Senator Cleveland um, gave a pretty good overview of our legislative um, approach and priorities this past session, and we know again that this is a system that is broken through and through. Um, and this, while while we may be making efforts in Washington State to continue leading on um, our community members being able to age in place and to provide options, uh, the system at large is broken. So um, we're going to need. Um, support at all levels. We're going to need uh, to know and to continue to learn from your members. I know that I've been well educated by AARP and, and the uh, members that meet with us um, in our legislative offices uh, to share their stories in my time as a legislator. Um, so I, I very much appreciate uh, getting a chance to know constituents that um, that have those stories, stories to share. So we really know who we're talking about when we're working on policy at the state level. But um, as the senator said, you know, we certainly um, have been supportive and will continue to be supportive of anything we can do to uh, provide options so that folks can um, age uh, at home where it's safe, healthy, and less costly. And um, then, of course, invest in the other options that may be necessary at other times. So glad to be here this evening. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And um, next is Ben Vecti, and Ben is, um, it's a really a privilege to have him working here in our state. He has worked on this issue um, in a variety of settings and in research and um, analyzing programs. Um, and I, I joke with him all the time that I've read his paper on Germany <laughs> um, and the program there. And um, he it's a, he's really an asset um, here in Washington state. He has so much knowledge about this issue and the complexities of it. Um, you know, what, one of the great things is people are talking about long-term care um, and nobody sits and talks about long-term care. I had friends in from out of town and we spent a good part of our dinner party sitting and talking about long-term care. Um, so, and that's, and that's the point of this, of this meeting tonight is just really a chance to have a little bit more of a conversation, get some information out there. There's a lot of misinformation floating around and it's complex. It's, you know, and it's all personal. It's all up to the individual circumstance and, and based on your income, your health, your family situation, what family supports you have. And so we're just hoping to really impart some information for you to, to learn from and to help you understand what the Walk Care Fund is and what a great opportunity it is for Washington State. Um, I'd like to point out um, that if you'd like to ask a question down at the bottom, if you just move your cursor down, there's a Q&A um, button down there. It looks like two conversation bubbles, bubbles and a Q&A. So please submit your questions there. Um, I also have a few questions that have come in on social media and that I've actually just received today from people. So I'm gonna also kind of share those out because I think they start some good conversation. And so Ben is going to go ahead and open us up and go over through a PowerPoint deck. But then as I see questions come in, I might jump in and kind of interrupt and we might, you know, talk about a particular subject a little bit more. And then Senator Cleveland and Representative Stonier, you know, please feel free to chime in. If you come off of mute, I can tell that you want to make a comment. And But I really want to make sure that we're having a dialogue about this as well. So go ahead, Ben. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you, Senator Cleveland and Representative Stonier for championing this uh, important solution to the long-term care challenges of Washingtonians. Um, well, today I will, I'll try to be brief um, to give you an overview of why we need a new approach to long-term care. What is the new program, the Walk Cares Fund? Why is it good for Washington? Why is it good for our families? How, and how does it work? And then we'll get to your questions. We'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end, because I know that's why we're here today. 
We all have concerns about aging, whether it's about our own future or a family member or friend. The following two scenarios are familiar to most of us. Barb's mother is in her 80s and keeps falling at home. Now she's broken her arm. She lives alone and there is no family in town to help. Siobhan doesn't want to be a burden to her adult children. They have their own children to care for. She's having trouble getting in and out of the tub and is afraid of falling. These are common concerns that many of us face with our aging parents or as we ourselves age. Uh, I just spent the last week and a half visiting my father uh, in, who lives in the woods in a two-story cabin. A year ago, he's 83 years old, and a year ago he fell down the stairs uh, and nearly died from the fall and had a difficult recovery. Uh, my mother had Parkinson's, uh, and that was a 15-year journey with her, uh, and she passed away a couple of years ago. And we all have these stories in our lives. Uh, and we all know that when the, when the need for long-term care strikes, it's a crisis. Uh, and we, we're all faced, you know, all the family members are drawn into the crisis. Uh, and this program will help address that. As people live longer, dementia is becoming more prevalent and people often have multiple chronic conditions and medications to take. Have you ever had similar concerns to either of these scenarios? Naomi is afraid her dad's dementia is getting worse. He put plastic wear on the stove and nearly burned down his kitchen. He refuses to move to a facility or hire help. Ruben's grandfather could really use medication reminders to keep on top of his insulin doses before he ends up in a crisis and nutritious meal delivery to keep his blood pressure low. Worry about our parents and grandparents or our own health as we age is something we all cope with. And the need for long-term care doesn't always wait until we're older. Uh, Calvin is a working age individual with a need for long-term care following an accident. He spent most of his savings on medical care and worries he won't have enough left to pay for help with the everyday activities like bathing and dressing so that he can lead the life he wants to lead. He has family in his life, but they also work and he doesn't want to cause stress in their lives. He is a young man and enjoys his independence. Long-term care is expensive and can overwhelm an individual or family's finances. Let's look at these examples. Hakeem turned 50 last year, and after caring for his mom, he realized he needs long-term care insurance but can't afford it. It would cost him $2,700 a year. That is the average cost of a premium across the country. And uh, that uh, it's important to keep in mind, I know that there's a lot of information being spread now by insurance brokers uh, quoting prices for long-term care insurance. Sometimes they quote the price around this level, sometimes they quote it lower. It's important to keep in mind, this is the average cost nationwide. This is what it really costs around the country currently. Oftentimes a price will be quoted at a lower rate, but then it goes up over time. And sure, there is a strong history. If you talk to the Office of the Insurance Commissioner in our state, there are, they receive many complaints, hundreds of complaints about cases where premiums have gone up significantly over time. And oftentimes someone will pay in for decades and then they're on a fixed income in retirement and they can no longer afford it and the premium gets increased again several times in retirement. Many times people are forced to drop coverage at that point because they can't afford it. And then they're left with nothing and they've paid in for decades uh, and are left with nothing. What's important to keep in mind here too is that when you're comparing the cost of private long-term care insurance to the WalkCares Fund, for the vast majority of people, the WalkCares Fund is cheaper on an annual basis. The typical premium is about $300 a year for the WalkCares Fund, whereas the average premium in private insurance is $2,700 a year. That's nine times as high. But even if you go beyond, the, the, the annual premium isn't really what's relevant. What's relevant is the lifetime premium. So let's say I'm a 50-year-old person. Um, I'm 54 myself. If I'm considering, if you're 50 years old and you're considering what to do today, if you were to stay in the WalkCares Fund um, and pay, you'd pay premiums until you retire, let's say until you're 65. That's 15 years of premiums. The typical worker will pay uh, $300 a year into the program. So that's $4,500 in premiums for a lifetime benefit of $36,500. It's a fantastic deal. If you purchase private long-term care insurance, you, don't, you pay an annual premium, which is probably much higher. And you not only pay it for those 15 years, you pay it until the day you die or need care. Because if you drop your coverage before you die, um, and then you end up needing care after that, uh, you won't have coverage. So, uh, you know, if you're 80 or 85 and you're sitting at the kitchen table with your spouse trying to figure out how to pay the bills and you have this bill of 
$2,700 a year or $2,000 a year for your long-term care insurance. And maybe you both have it. So it's $4,000 or $5,000 a year for you as a couple. That's a really difficult decision to make on a fixed income in retirement uh, to figure out, do we, te- do we keep paying this? Uh, we can't really afford it. What do we do? Well, so keep that in mind that for private insurance, you pay it until the day you die or need care, which if you're a 50 year old is probably 35 years of payments. Uh, whereas for the Walk Cares Fund, you would only have 15, 15 years of payments. So you pay the private insurance twice as long. That's an important cost consideration. Um, another thing to keep in mind in this issue is that when we need long-term care as we age, it has a ripple effect on our families. It's not just, so being prepared for the need for long-term care is a favor that you not only do for yourself, it's a favor you do to your, for your spouse and for your children. I know that when my mom needed long-term care, um, her husband was 60 years old uh, at the time, and he was planning on working another 10 years. He, was a, he, had a, he did not have very high earnings over his career. He did not have hardly anything saved for retirement. And, but he had to quit his job at age 60 in order to care for my mom. Uh, his, his job was actually to be an RNA caring for people in assisted living facilities. So he was actually very well suited to caring for my mom. But when she died five years later, he was 65 and he was too old and tired to get back into the workforce at that time. And people did, it was very hard, would have been hard for him to get hired anyway at 65. And the job that he was doing is difficult work, carrying people in and out of the shower and so forth. And so he wasn't able to get back into the workforce. And so the fact that my mom wasn't prepared really affected his own economic security and his own retirement security. And this is a very common situation. I have a colleague who who just moved across the state of Washington to be near her father who is older and and needs help. Um, And because he wasn't prepared for that, she had to quit her job and get off of her career path in her 40s in order to help him. And now she's earning less money than she had been earning and will probably never get back on that career path that she was on. And so it's important to keep in mind that the need for long-term care, uh, being prepared for that is a decision that not only affects us individually, it affects our children's economic security and it affects us our, our spouse's economic security. So why is this important for the state of Washington as a whole? Well, if you look at the blue line here, this is the population 85 or older in Washington state. It is going up considerably, as you see here. It is going to double over the next 15 years. So as much, this is a big problem for us all in our own families, but it's also a problem for the state and for taxpayers in the state because the population needing care is going to double over the next 15 years. As a result, the Medicaid caseloads are going to probably double as well uh, without the Walk Cares Fund. So if the Walk Cares Fund had not been enacted, um, our state Medicaid system, which is the main way we pay for long-term care today, would have had to bear this burden of paying for the additional care that the bigger population, 85 and older, would need. And what would that do? Well, that would mean that, that sales taxes and other taxes would, ha- would have had to go up considerably to pay for the increased Medicaid costs associated with the age wave. Um, over the last two years, long-term care costs made up 6.3% of the budget that could have gone up to 10 or 12% of the budget without the Walk Cares Fund. So with the Walk Cares Fund, that problem is solved. We have a new system in place that will address this through a self-funded program, much like Medicare or Social Security. It's funded by worker premiums. And so taxes won't have to go up to pay for the age wave. Why do families need a new approach to long-term care? Well, right now, the way we pay for long-term care is based on some false assumptions. The, the assumption is that, um, that most families in the state uh, have someone at home who can provide unpaid care. Um, and that if we, need, we have someone in the family who needs care, there'll be someone there to do it. You know, maybe 30 years ago, that might've been the case to a broader extent. Although it's not clear if that was ever really the case to a significant extent. But today, because of you know, growing economic inequality um, there are very few, and just changes in, in, in family relations and gender relations, you know, women are in the workforce now, but even without those changes, the fact is that most families cannot afford to have an adult uh, stay at home and not work because it's hard to pay the bills. And most families can't afford to pay the bills uh, if they have adult, an adult who's able to work, who's staying at home as an unpaid caregiver. 
So someone may take a few years off to, to raise a child, but to permanently stay out of the labor force, that, that's rare these days. And so, but our existing system assumes that that's in place, but it simply isn't the case anymore. And so what happens is the case here with Diane and her father, where um, a family uh, has a need for care, a parent needs care. Family, the children or spouse kick in money as long as they can, but eventually the family runs out of money that they have available to pay for this. And the, the, the parent ends up having to go on Medicaid. This is a really difficult for situation for families. It restricts the choices that families have. There are a lot of, there's a lot of red tape associated with Medicaid that comes from the federal government because this is a federal state program with a lot of federal guidelines. Many people end up having to go to a nursing home much sooner than they would have otherwise wanted to do because uh, they can't afford to pay for home care. And even if a family you know, would like to pay for home care, most families can't afford it out of pocket. Um, the, the typical income you know, in Washington state for seniors is $56,000. That's for household income, not individual, but for a household. So the typical couple you know, who's retired in Washington state, they have $56,000 before taxes. After taxes, that might be $40,000. Those, you know, the, most families can't afford to pay for a year of home care out of that. A year of home care costs about $33,000. And so families are, are stuck and end up having to go on Medicaid uh, and many times move their parent into a nursing home. That's no one's vision for how they want their, their aging, the, the, the old, their, their process of aging to go. Um, most of us would prefer to age in place at home. So what is the Walk Cares Fund? It's a universal long-term care program that builds on the proud tradition uh, and the values that underlie um, Social Security and Medicare. Um, before Social Security and Medicare, the whole idea of retirement didn't even exist in America. Uh, before Social Security, older adults were forced to move in with their children in a small room upstairs, um, and they didn't have independence in old age. They didn't have this concept of retirement. Before Medicare, people could retire they might be able to retire independently, but if they had a healthcare need, it would impoverish them and they would have to go on public assistance. Um, but now with Social Security and Medicare, people can retire with, with dignity in the United States. But, but more recently, this, the, with the increasing need for long-term care because people are living longer and there aren't as many stay-at-home caregivers, it has created a new type of risk in old age, which is this risk around long-term care and not being protected against it. The Walk Cares Fund provides a new pillar, a third pillar of retirement security, which is uh, this long-term care security. It's an earned benefit. It's not subsidized by the government. It's entirely funded by contributions by workers. So this, this relieves pressure on, on the government's general fund so that taxes don't have to go up to pay for the Medicaid costs associated with the age wave. It's affordable by definition because programs like Medicare or Social Security are funded by a, a premium based on your wages, a percentage of your wages. And in this case, it's a really low premium. It's about a half a percent of your wages. So for the typical worker, that's about $25 a month uh, for the typical worker who makes up $52,000 a year. If you make a lot less than that, then you owe a lot less than that. So if you make $20,000 a year, you only owe about $10 a month. The lifetime benefit is $36,500, and that will go up up to inflation, it's adjusted every year up to inflation. So 20 or 30 years from now, that'll probably be $50,000 $50, because it will go up, up to inflation. Contributions begin next January and benefits begin in 2025. Um, just a, a brief comparison of the current way or the old way that we have dealt with financing long-term care and the new way. The current way we deal with it is that long-term care insurance is unaffordable for most. Only about 7% of people can afford to pay private long-term care insurance premiums throughout retirement, most of us can't afford that. We're afraid of not being able to remain in our home as we age. I know that my mom had to go to, into an assisted living facility in a nursing home. Um, and um, I worry that that might happen to me. I worry that my dad might be forced to do that. He certainly has made it clear he does not wanna do that. Um, I, we all worry about what needing long-term care could mean to the economic security and retirement security of our spouses and our children. And we worry about having to burn through our life savings and not be able to leave anything to our children and ultimately have to rely on Medicaid, which could restrict our choices in old age. The new way through the Walk Cares Fund is that for the first time in the history of this state, in the history of this country, 
long-term care insurance is affordable for everyone. Anybody who wants it can have affordable long-term care insurance. We have peace of mind that when we're older, we'll have, not only we, but our families will have a budget of 36,500 in today's dollars and it'll go up over time. They'll have a, we'll have a significant budget for which to pay for long-term care. So what, what does that mean? Well, that means that in a situation like my dad, where he fell down the stairs, if there's a crisis like that in your family, um, what, what's really very important is that you get someone in the home quickly to care for that person. My dad lives alone in the woods. If, if, he, had a, if he could have a home care aide come in quickly after a fall like that, um, his, that could prevent a decline in his health status. And as we all know, when someone has a health incident like that, what's very common is your health status can decline very quickly. And someone can go from just being an older adult to passing away in a very rapid period of time if you can't have a quick intervention. And with the Walk Cares Fund, a family will have a significant budget to hire a home care aid right away so that, so that their parent um, um, you know, or us ourselves have someone there to take care of us so that we don't have our health situation deteriorate. Finally, the Walk Cares Fund gives families choices and freedom to decide how they want to care for their for themselves or their family members. So with the Walk Cares Fund, you can either hire a professional to come in and care for you, or you can hire a family member. So you can make a loved one a paid caregiver if that's your choice. So that, that's a, an option for people who want to keep the money in the household to help you pay your bills as a family. So those are that's an overview of the program. A couple of final details. Um, there is no uh, employer contribution. This is funded entirely by worker premiums. Um, and if you're self-employed, you can choose to opt in if you so desire. Finally, there is a vesting period of 10 years for a permanent vesting. So much like Social Security or Medicare, you have to pay in 10 years in order to be permanently qualified. If you pay in three out of the last six years, you're temporarily vested. And to earn a vesting year, you have to pay, pay in on based on 500 hours of work in a year. So if you work quarter time, which is about a day, day and a quarter, day and a half a week, um, over the course of a year, then you can earn a vesting year. Um, that provides, I think, the basics. And I will give you one final piece of information, which is that if you have more questions after today, this is our website address, wacaresfund.wa.gov. There's plenty of information there if you want to learn more. And if you want to email us, you can email us at wacaresfund at dshs.wa.gov, and we will answer your questions. With that, I'll pass it back to you, Kathy. Okay, we have a lot of questions <laughs> that have come in. Um, so the first one um, is from Stephen, and he asks about the portability. Um, he has a multi-tier question here, but the first question is, you know, kind of about, um, you know, paying into this program. And then, you know, if you live in Washington, um, great, you can access this benefit. But if you don't, it's it's not accessible um, in another state. Could you talk about that or either Senator or Representative Stonier, if you wanna chime in as well? Ben? I'm happy to take that. Sure, so under the current statute, that is correct. Um, you have to be, you can leave the state, but at the time you need care, you would have to come back to the state in order to receive services. That's in part because uh, it's a logistical challenge. We don't have a way to pay for care in other states currently. Uh, we don't have a provider network in other states that has the ability to build the state of Washington. So those are things that we would have to get set up. I would say the program is new and we're fine tuning some of those aspects. Um, we don't start paying benefits till 2025. So we're working on all of these issues. There is an oversight body called the LTSS Trust Commission, which oversees the program. And they consider policy options every year to improve the program. And this specific issue is an issue which we have, we have heard these concerns from constituents and we have flagged that for the commission. And they are looking at that issue this year and considering uh, if there's any ways to address it. So stay tuned on that. There may be more information on that uh, later this year. Uh, I can't get ahead of the work of the commission. They're doing their work uh, deliberatively, but that's something to um, stay tuned for. In addition to what the commission is working on, I know um, AARP, I've talked to a lot of my colleagues in other states, and they are very much looking at um, very similar types of programs for their state. 
And if that happens, um, so for example, California, I know Utah, Illinois, there's a couple others back east. But if that happens, there could be potentially reciprocal agreements with those other states. And we do something very similar right now with our prescription drugs. We have a compact agreement with multiple states. Um, so there's real potential there. And you know, we do have time to kind of work on this. The next part of Stephen's question is, you know, nobody's going to benefit until 2032. And could, so could you walk through, I think a lot of people don't understand this vesting, Ben. Um, I even have a hard time explaining it. The, you know, the three of six years and then also just the incredible, um, you know, value that 500 hours that you pay into this. And, you know, again, I was sharing an example of a friend of mine who's nearing retirement. She's in her 60s. And um, she said, you know, I want to invest in this and I'm going to go work at one of the wineries and work at their concerts, you know, and, um, you know, for one, one or two days a week. And so I can still pay into this. And so I think there's a lot of people that are in the same position. And I know, Ben, you have some thoughts on that. And Senator and Representative Sonia, please comment as well. Sure. I think I'll kick it off. Um, it sounds like Senator Cleveland, your dog has some some feedback there too. <laughs> um, so the the I would first say that um, uh, there, if you've paid in for three years, you are eligible for benefits temporarily. So if you've paid in for three years, uh, we that's why we are starting to pay benefits in 2025. You uh, you if you have a health incident, you know within three years of paying in for three years then you'd be eligible. So for example, if I'm 62 next January and I pay in for three years, and then I retire three years later, I'll have paid in three years, I'll be 65. And if I quit working then I would be eligible for benefits if I needed care before the age of 68. And same thing if I'm in mid career uh, or any point in my career, and if, if I paid in for three years and then I have some kind of uh, accident, maybe a motorcycle accident or a ski accident, I would be eligible. Um, if you want to be permanently eligible for benefits, you have to pay in for 10 years, just like with Medicare or Social Security. And in, in, in that case, what's really important to remember for people near retirement, uh, as Kathy said, you know, many of us after we retire from our main job that we did most of our lives, have hobbies in retirement or other things. Maybe we want to help a child in the child in our son or daughter's business uh, a few hours a week, or maybe we want to Maybe we have hobbies like making kayak paddles and selling them on Etsy or making sweaters and selling them on Etsy, or maybe we need a little extra money. I mean, most, most people need a little extra money in retirement and do something, working at a local store or whatever it may be. So there's, there's a lot, and you don't have to earn a lot of money to earn an additional investing year. It doesn't matter how much you earn. It's just, as long as you're working uh, 500 hours, which is about one quarter time, uh, then you can earn additional vesting years. So that can help people close to retirement get to 10 years. The other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that the LTSS Trust Commission, our oversight body, is looking very closely at if, if there's ways to allow people to continue to pay in for a few years after retirement if they haven't gotten their 10 years in so that they can get to 10 years and be permanently vested. Um, that is an option the commission is going to be looking at at their next meeting and if, they, if that is recommended, that's something that would really make it possible for everyone close to retirement to have permanent vesting in this program if they so desire. Um, and, I'll, and I appreciate this discussion and these questions because you know, one of the things we discussed uh, is just what kind of implementation timeline works well for the opportunity for constituents to weigh in ask such questions and then the commission can respond in kind. And so um, anyways, I just appreciate the questions and I feel like as I'm reading them in the chat, I'm grateful that they are, they're questions that we kind of considered in the process as well. So we could have some answers for you all this evening. So um, the next part is Stephen's question was also related to comparing, identifying the benefits of private plans will contain. And, you know, from AARP's perspective, you know, again, it's unique to each individual and you need to look at, you know, what pre-existing conditions are covered or not covered. And what happens if you, you know, you've paid into a plan and then you end up having a heart attack. Is that, you know, an, uh, an event that will then, you know, cancel your long-term care insurance. 
what type of setting um, does your insurance pay for? Um, when the long-term care insurance market started, it was only nursing home care. Um, they've since changed and they will fund and pay for um, in-home care, but you need to, again, consumer beware. There's another question here you know, about women. We know that women on average pay more for long-term care insurance because we live longer. Um, and so that's something to also consider um, and to weigh your options. But as Ben mentioned earlier, it's really about the total cost because you are gonna be paying on a fixed income well into your retirement years. You, you know, if you live a long, strong, healthy life, you're gonna be paying premiums 20 to 30 years longer. Um, but after you retire and you've vested in this program, the 36,005 is your benefit. So sorry, I kind of weighed in on my, the question response there. Does anyone else want to add anything? There is one woman um, here also that is, um, she is um, really, this is one of the things that the Walk Cares program, this is like a real time, I did not plant this question. Here's a woman who is trapped in her home. She needs a wheelchair ramp. And so I'm gonna figure out how to help you. Um, I'm just saying her first name, Debbie. And I sent her a link to the area agencies on aging um, to see if they can help and assist you because yes, there are um, vendors that you know the area agencies work with and we're gonna find you some assistance. I'll, I, I will try to follow up with you after this as well. Um, and then there's a question, um, you know, $100 does not seem like a lot. $100 a day, what if I need more? And that's something also, too, that changed in the legislation. Ben, can you kind of jump in on that? Sure. Um, that's, that's a misconception. In an early stage of the legislation, there had been a $100 a day cap, but that was removed before the legislation was finalized because legislators wanted Washingtonians to be able to use the benefit however they, it best suits their needs. And so there is no daily uh, cap on benefits on, or monthly cap on, on use and how you can use your benefit. You can use it however you need to use it uh, to meet your needs. And that flexibility was really important partly um, for the reasons that Ben mentioned earlier where different families have different availability to different sorts of support. So if you have family members or um, a, a, ch a church family or you know something where some of those um, needs can be met without utilizing the program. Um, the, it's important for, for people to have the, the, the options and the flexibility to use um, resources as they, as they see fit and can kind of um, work um, for their independent needs and uh, what, they, what they currently have as resource and support. So there's a question from Heidi. It sounds like this would only pay for a year of long-term care given the lifetime maximum and the figure you quoted for home care. Is that right? Well, it depends on how, how you use it, right? I mean, um, if, if it were me, um, depending on, you know, I would probably try to combine it with, um, you know, most people have loved ones in their life, not everyone, but most people have loved ones in their life who can provide some degree of unpaid assistance, whether it's a spouse or a child who can help some or, or church members or whatever it may be. Um, so if you have some of that, you may be able to extend it to two years of care. Um, but if you don't have that, then yes, that would be one year of care. I think the intent behind this was to respect the goal of government, the role of government in society, you know, having a, a modest premium and a modest benefit, you know, the, 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 the intent was to keep the premium very affordable for people. So it's only half a percent of wages. If, there, if, you know, if the, the legislature could have had a much higher benefit, but then a much, that would have required a much higher premium because this is self-funded. There's no subsidy for this. This is self-funded from worker premiums. And so, uh, so that was the, the trade-off that was made. What we are trying to do, and actually Senator Cleveland was in, in, instrumental in this last year, this past session is to help us, um, call on us to work with the private insurers to develop supplemental private insurance plans. So, we're, we're going to be working with private insurance companies to develop sort of Medigap style supplemental coverage to the Watt Cares benefit so that if someone wants $100,000 worth of insurance coverage, then they can purchase 
uh, the, the difference between our benefit and that $100,000. Uh, and that premium should be a lot lower um, than what people pay today for $100,000 in coverage. Because right now, if a private insurance company is selling a $100,000 policy, they have to price the whole thing. And that's why premiums are so high. But if the walk, with the walk cares benefit, you could have that and then buy a top up coverage that's a lot more affordable because the insurance company only has to price the coverage above our benefit. And so hopefully in the future, people can have whatever degree of coverage they want. They can either have our modest benefit or if they want more insurance, they could buy more on the private market. Uh, there's another question about pre-existing conditions. Um, so this person saying, I can't get long-term care coverage because I had cancer. Um, if I pay into this, will my diagnosis matter when I need care? I'm assuming that's what they mean. No, do you want to take that second or do you want me? <laughs> Thanks, Ben. You go right ahead, or you know, I'm happy to respond that that's one of the, I think, biggest benefits of this fund and this program is the fact that um, um, you, you, it doesn't matter um, you know, what condition you're facing. Um, that benefit is available to you if you need services. If I could add to that, I think that's one of the main virtues of this program is that, you know, this is a time of life, um, you know, when you're unable to work because you're older and you and you need care, or if you had an accident and you need care, this is the time when we're most vulnerable in our lives. And this a program like this is designed to make it as easy as possible for us to get assistance when we need assistance. Um, unfortunately, with private long-term care insurance, you know, the business model is obviously it's a for-profit enterprise. Um, and so there is a business model where um, you try to uh, you know, not sell coverage to people who you think might need it. So there is an underwriting process which is designed to um, uh, rule out anybody who they, who they think might need the coverage. And then when it's time to claim it, there's a whole other department called claims adjusters whose job it is to not pay claims you know, if possible, to, pay, to pay, not pay any claims that they don't need to pay. And so there's a lot of filters there that make it both hard to get the coverage and hard to claim the coverage uh, because that in a pro, that's the business model. In, in this program, there is no business model like that. We have a, a, an incentive to make it as easy as possible for people to claim the benefit. And if, and if someone isn't happy, you know, the first thing they're gonna do is gonna complain to their local legislature, legislator. And the first thing they're gonna do is complain to my team. And we're gonna try to be as responsive as possible to Washingtonians and make it as easy as possible uh, to claim and no one is ruled out because of health status. Ben, if I could add to that, uh, as chair of the Senate Health Care Committee, I uh, have lost count of how many times um, we've um, had the insurance industry come before us and share with the committee the fact that uh, the business model for long-term care insurance in the private market uh, is not viable. Uh, that uh, uh, it was difficult for a profit to be made, and therefore that's why we saw so many uh, plans fail and so many uh, long-term uh, care plans um, end. And um, I think that um, that's something that we all need to keep in mind as we consider um, all that we're hearing from the private insurance market uh, around long-term care. Uh, that nothing's changed to make their, that business model any more viable. Uh, and, and so um, other than uh, you'll have to take a really close look at plans that potentially are newer now being offered uh, and ensure that uh, um, premiums aren't going to be uh, going up on a regular basis that uh, coverage is what you expect it to be or what it's uh, being presented to you as being. So I, I would just um, caution people to really um, look hard at uh, any plan that they're considering. So another question we have um, is, do people need to have a formal employer or can self-employed persons contribute and participate? Self-employed people can opt into the program and participate. Um, so there's information on our website, walkcaresfund.wa.gov about that. Uh, that. That starts in January that you can opt into the program and then you would simply pay the premium based on your net earnings as a self-employed individual. 
and one of the questions that you know we get a lot with AARP, and I know you covered this a little bit, Ben, is, um, and I know you talked about the the trust commission and the work that's going on, um, but I think it's important for people who are either retired or near retirement to know that we hear you. We know that you know there um, these were issues that you know we started working on um, five years ago or more. And we knew that this was a concern and definitely AARP being an advocate for people 50 and older, you know, it was a primary concern for us. And, but we also knew that we needed to get this program up and running and that we had time to make some of these fixes. Um, did anybody want to add to that? I'll certainly add that um, we recognize with any, um, policies that we um, put forward and pass in the legislature that as implementation uh, begins that um, there are always um, adjustments to be made and learnings as we go forward. And so, um, you know, new policies, um, uh, you know, it's not uh, un unusual that um, there be um, issues that arise and concerns that crop up and, uh, as you, I think, indicated, Kathy and Ben, you as well, um, we are taking a hard look at um, a lot of those, all of those um, different concerns and questions that are coming up and um, looking at ways that they can be best addressed. Yeah, and Kathy, I think you made an important point. It was, you know, this is, this is a need that our community has had from years in the past. So getting the program up and going and started um, while we kind of evaluate the implementation details was key in order to make sure that benefits would be available to Washingtonians as soon as we could make that happen. So um, I think that's, you know, just again, like I mentioned before, these questions are really great because I feel like um, we'll have to keep evaluating those. And if we when we put the commission together and, and task them with the implementation details, um, hearing from, from you all uh, will greatly inform all of that work. Kathy, you're muted. I'm having a nice conversation with myself. <laughs> um, if you have, um, we're kind of getting ready to wrap up here, but um, if you have additional questions, um, there's a Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. It looks like two conversation uh, bubbles and it says Q&A, just click on there and you can type in your question. We've had some really, really great questions and I think it sparked some good discussion. And um, I wanna make sure, you know, based on the people, if you feel like your question hasn't been answered, please type it in again. Um, there was one person that came in late and they wanted to review again how much it costs to pay into this program and just the, wanted to understand those details just one more time. Sure, sure. It's about a half a percent of your wages. It's, so it's whatever your income is, whatever your, your W-2 wages are times 0 0.0058. So for, for someone who makes $50,000, it's $300 a year. And that's $24 a month. Uh, if you make twice that, you know, twice that, if you make half that, you know, half that. And you only owe it while you're working. So you owe it if you're, if you're unemployed or take time off, or if you're having, you know, if you were laid off during the pandemic or something like that, you wouldn't owe it during times when you're not working. So it's, but, but it's like, like, just like Medicare, Social Security, it's designed to be affordable so that only, so people pay in while they're able to afford it, while they're working. And if you're, if, you, if, if you've, uh, you know, been laid off or something, you don't owe it. I think that's a really important point as a mother of two kids. I, you know, I took off time from work to raise them. And I know, you know, my career, tra career trajectory is not quite the same as it could have been. Um, but, you know, I would never have, you know, not taken off that time to raise my daughters. And um, I think that's a huge point because I think, you know, again, and I have a mother who's 83 years old and I, I find myself spending more and more time helping her pay her bills, you know, cleaning out her refrigerator with all the moldy food, <laughs> getting her to doctor's appointments, 
Um, and that's only going to increase. And I think, you know, what I like about this, while well, she's not necessarily paying into, I'm not going to leave the same burden for my children. So um, of how to pay for this. So I think that's the thing that intrigues me the most. I think, you know, from ARP's perspective, why we are really focused in on this. The other thing is just being able to pay a family caregiver. We just released a report called the, um, it's related to the, um, the, well, there's a federal bill that we're also working on called the Credit for Caring Act. And um, it's basically giving um, people who provide care because they're spending more than $7,000 a year out of pocket to pay for caregiving expenses for their, you know, for their loved one. So I just look at, you know, you think about rent, you think about paying, helping your loved one pay for medications or meals or somebody to come in and clean their house. Um, because that's the last thing I want to do on a weekend is going down and clean my house <laughs> um, when I haven't done my own. Um, so I, I just think it's really important, again, for, like I said at the opening, for everybody to view, you know, what's best for them, you know, and their own situation and their own family. Um, so I'd like to have some closing remarks from Senator Cleveland and Representative Fournier, and we'll go ahead and start wrapping up. Great, thank you to you both. And um, I'll just um, conclude by um, again stressing um, how important it is to reach out with your questions and um, uh, and let us know if you have questions or concerns that you aren't finding information that that addresses. Uh, and and we're here to to help and. Um, really feel strongly that um, this proactive um, approach to addressing this um, very um, large and looming um, crisis, um, it, it, you know, is um, innovative, it's different, changes is hard sometimes to embrace, but uh, I'm proud of the fact that as a state, we're leading uh, in this area where, uh, as Kathy said earlier, um, we have other states that are also looking to follow. And um, I am positive that this will be a shining example and model for um, many, many other states um, going forward. And I just encourage um, everyone to um, Find out all that you can and uh, talk with your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. Let them know uh, about this exciting new program that's going to help uh, better ensure that that all of us can um, feel some mm -hmm. sense of security and um, peace of mind that we're going to be able to meet um, our um, long-term healthcare needs uh, as we uh, age going forward. Although um, I try not to age, but. Uh, I don't think, don't think I'm being successful. <laughs> You're doing a very good job. <laughs> uh, and in full agreement with Senator Cleveland, uh, feedback is always key, especially uh, when we're, you know, out in front with implement, with standing up a program and implementation. And there's, when nobody else has done it before, we really need to hear from the people that will be, be impacted. Um, so tonight, I think is a really good example of that kind of outreach. You know, um, AARP has been uh, a great advocate on a number of policies that we know are generational problems. I remember working on a bill having to do with um, debt forgiveness from um, higher education debt, right? And, and and that's because so many of our aging population, our, our grandparents and, and parents are, are taking on the debt that they're um, <clears throat> children are under, unable to pay. And so to me, this is just another example of a generational challenge that uh, we are working to address for the betterment of the health and care of the people in the state, but also um, for the sake of the budget, both in your families and at the state level, uh, because absent that we pay a whole lot more than we should when we are not preventative um, and, and aren't working to keep people safe and healthy longer so that they have more years before they get to that long-term care um, stage. So uh, I, I'm, I'm proud of the program. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to hear from folks this evening. And we'll just double down on Senator Cleveland's request for folks to 
um, forward questions and continue to stay in communication uh, as you're maybe thinking about it over the weekend or something and you have more questions just to, to come back to us. Ben, any other final thoughts? I would echo all of that's been said and you reach out to us as well the, through our website or through their email address or me personally uh, with questions. We're also happy to give presentations uh, at firm, you know, employers, if you're an you know, employer or if you like at your company for a, if you're an employee and you'd like us to come in, let us know and we'd be happy to come do a presentation like this for your team uh, so that they better understand the program. One final thought that just occurred to me as, as everyone was speaking was that this program is also going to be really good for, for to create jobs in rural areas because a lot of older adults live in rural areas and it's often hot, hard to bring jobs into those areas. And I know, because I remember for my dad in upstate uh, New York where he lives, he, uh, you know, the, there weren't any caregivers anywhere near where he lived because he's in a remote area. But once this program is up and running, there'll be a lot of jobs created in rural areas for people caring for older adults. And it could really revitalize uh, some rural economies. So that's another advantage that this could bring. Great. Well, thank you all. And um, again, I appreciate your time on this lovely fall. fall I won't even say it. Summer, <laughs> fall. <laughs> Fallmer? <sighs> Evening at five o'clock. But thank you again for your time. Um, this is such an important topic. And it's just really exciting to see this program, you know, getting ready to take off and it's going to, you know, impact and improve the lives of so many people here in Washington state. And I think we're going to look back on this, you know, come 2025 when the first benefits are paid out and, you know, be really proud of this hard work and the hard questions that, you know, people asked us and forced us to be better. Um, but I think, you know, there's great opportunity ahead of us. So thank you. Good evening. Good night. Thank you so much.